So it's great to be here. Uh, Glenn and I got together yesterday afternoon with our, our colleague Mark Johnson from MCNC North Carolina, and we had a chance to, to talk a little bit about today. The main message is we want this to be interactive. Um, there's there, none of these slides are, are written in stone. Most of them will probably be out of date tomorrow. Uh, but the idea here is to have a discussion, maybe find out some of the, some of the needs that exist around the state. And so what what I want to do, I'm, my, I'm deputy CIO at the University of Utah, and I have a pretty disparate job, but I do come from, as, as the introduction said, I do come from a background in advanced networking. And, and I think one of the things that we view, and I think Glenn's career demonstrates, is that, that higher education can lead out in internet development. And at the U, we're very interested in working with our partners in the state and in the commercial sector on, on ways to do that, because we can't do this alone. And particularly as we talk about some of the, uh, the evolving models in higher education, it's, uh, broadband connectivity is critical. So the, 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 the theme here is what, what does a research university, the PAC-12, and the Utah ICT economy have in common? And I, uh, as Glenn's pointed out, I should explain what ICT is. It's primarily a European term, but it refers to information and communications technology rather than just saying IT. And I think that's probably more descriptive of what we're really doing uh, you know, the difference between a telephone company and a cloud provider um, is, is not that great anymore. So one of the things that's happened, I realize it's dangerous to come to Utah County and put up a, a Utah football slide, uh, but uh, actually there, there's, there's something that's substantial here. Uh, by, by the you joining the, the Pac-12 a little more than two years ago, uh, we did more than join an athletic conference. Uh, like in, in the Big Ten and also in the ACC as well as the Ivy League, the Pac-12 schools uh, collaborate at, at the academic level. Um, and it certainly means that we have to raise our game now if we're going to work with the likes of Stanford, uh, UCLA, uh, University of Arizona, and University of Washington. So um, I, I decided I'd show a photo of the Stanford game rather than last week's Arizona State game. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens on Saturday at the Coliseum. Uh, but uh, I, I think I I in many ways at the U, this uh, realization is just beginning to seep in. Uh, we know we're in an athletics arm arms race that so we'll need to expand our stadium, our basketball arena, um, and also uh, we're working with Jeff Egley and his colleagues at UEN to improve uh, uh, the video connectivity in our sports venues for the Pac-12 network. But it also means we're, we're looking at a different set of, of academic institutions as, as our peers. There's a little bit of history here, and I think the history bodes very well. Um, there was a network uh, known as the ARPANET, which actually was the, in many ways, the predecessor of the internet. It came online in 1969. It was uh, uh, developed with federal support, and actually a lot of vision that came out of the, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration. And the first three nodes of that network were in California, uh, uh, Stanford, UCLA, and at uh, UCSB. But the fourth node actually was at the University of Utah. And, if, and that's what you see in, in, the, in the left there, that, 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 that napkin diagram of the network where, where uh, Utah had a lone uh, digital PDP-10 uh, computer connected to the network. But that, in many ways, was the beginning of, what, of, of the network that led to the internet and, and essentially packet-based networking being demonstrated on a large scale in the United States. Uh, in, in the right, you see uh, essentially a view of the ARPANET as it was funded for the next 10 years. And, and, and what you might say is that Utah was one of the few states in what people on the coast call the flyover states that actually had a connection. And I think this is really important that we, we've always been a dot on the map. And it's something that at the University of Utah we feel very important that we need to be part of, part of any national networking initiative because research funding, research collaboration falls that activity. And, and as an example of that, around this same time we had a very uh, strong effort in computer graphics at the University of Utah. Um, um, if you know the company Evans and Sutherland, which um, for many years existed in our research park, uh, uh, David Evans, who was the chair of the department, and Ivar Sutherland, who came from Harvard, uh, uh, brought, really built a very strong program in computer graphics. This slide is from Chris Johnson, who leads our, our Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute. But we've had a number of people, John Warnock, who of course is, uh, leads Adobe, which has a significant presence up in Lehigh now. Um, Ed Catmull, who leads, who leads uh, Pixar. 
um, Ed, Ed Clark, who started SGI, as well as Netscape, and Nolan Bushnell, who uh, started Atari, as well as Chuck E. Cheese Pizza. Uh, the latter one might not have been the best business plan in technology. Um, but there's, there, I, in our, you know, it, for me, what it boils down to is 20 years in this business, is you hear, you hear a phrase, of the virtuous circle of bandwidth. And, and I think it's a core principle that whenever you have new applications, it helps to drive new infrastructure. And then that, that infrastructure enables new applications. The same thing happens in science. If you give an astronomer a more powerful telescope, they'll be able to discover uh, 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 new objects. Um, if, if you give an applications developer either more memory or more storage or more bandwidth, they can develop off that. So I think in, in this sense, this does, does drive uh, bandwidth growth. Um, I just came out of a meeting on big data this morning talking to some people who are in genomics, and it's very clear the network is not keeping up with storage right now. Um, and I think that's, that's something that concerns us on our campus, and I think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the home bandwidth environment, where I think uh, bandwidth has been even more constrained over the last decade. So when I say real broadband, I'm really talking about broadband approaching a gigabit per second. That's what we typically offer uh, our, our, our faculty and staff in their, their, their offices. We're moving that way to, uh, in our wireless network. But wh why does real broadband then out in the community matter, matter to a research university like the U. I think, there, I think there are seven reasons. And the first really reflects the, the changing environment for delivering courses. Uh, you may have heard of the expression MOOCs, uh, massively open online courses. The idea of, of, of flipping the classroom, offering very large uh, classes with very, very modern uh, internet-based delivery methods, it's very clear that we're going to need to compete in that space. And, and if we're going to reach our current and prospective students, we're going to need to have good, not only uh, compelling content as well as, as, as crisp delivery me mechanisms, but we we'll also need the last mile to their homes connected. We actually believe this is a second point here is we believe it's very important for faculty competitiveness and retention that, that if, in trying to attract faculty to come to the University of Utah, their ability to move into a neighborhood with high bandwidth so that they, they can work from home at night um, which, which we don't expect them to do. We just give them tenure on that basis. Um, number three is staying connected with, uh, with our alumni. Uh, more important that, uh, than ever, I think, the idea of lifetime education. And certainly from a development standpoint, you want to maintain that connection with, with your alums. We, we run a, a small healthcare center up on, on the hill at the university, and, and we see a very strong motivator right now around telemedicine, and, and not just telemedicine, but also personalized medicine, where individual genomic information can be used to, to, to drive uh, individualized treatment uh, 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 programs, and, and for the large part, being able to do that conveniently. As, as a research university, we, we, and I'll, as I'll mention later on, we, we have a, a great interest in data gathering for field science, whether that's ecology or atmospheric science. Or, or other field sciences. We have a strong interest in supporting K-12, uh, since K-12 produces the, in Utah produces the bulk of our, our incoming students. We, we help do that through the Utah Education Network, uh, but also a project known as EPSCOR, which is a, an NSF project that's a collaboration, NSF, National Science Foundation sponsored project that's a collaboration of the three largest research universities, the U, the Y, and Utah State. Then we, finally, we think we have a role in helping to accelerate the IT economy in Utah. Uh, we do that in part by producing students who major in computer science or, or related disciplines. But we also do that by, by, by spinning out technologies out of our school of computing and, and, and other departments, and also just collaborating with, with the, the, the ICT uh, community at large. So that, that I think this is seven, re seven reasons for us why we're here and why we care about this space. Now, if you look at, at where we are right now in the state, um, this, these are my views. These are not the official opinion of the University of Utah. Um, but I think uh, as somebody that's been around this game for about 20 years, I, th I think we're in a good position, but we're not in a great position. And I think part of this, I, I'm, I'm pleased that GOED is taking this, this, this aggressive stance because I think we have to, we have to move things along in Utah. Uh, we look at Utah as, as a good first start. Um, it's amazing the, the national visibility 
and, and uh, interest that Utopia has attracted um, around the country. But it, it's not clear right now whether how far past the finish line Utopia is going to go. We are very intrigued by Google Fiber coming into Provo. And, uh, it, it, and it also evokes our, our U versus Y competitiveness. Uh, and, and, and I should emphasize that we're, in this space, we're a very strong collaborator at BYU. And we think this is great. We actually think this is great um, because now we can go to, to uh, CenturyLink and Comcast and, and say we've got to keep Salt Lake City um, on par with Provo. But uh, um, Glenn and I both know the, the, the lead for, for Google Fiber, uh, Milo Medine, who, who started out building IP networks for NASA back in the 80s. Um, they've, they've got a creative business plan, and as we know, they are very well capitalized. Um, I think it's very intriguing that Provo's on this map, and, 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 or on their map, along with Kansas City and Austin, and I think that's something we need to track. So, you know, we're, we're now in a position saying Provo got theirs, what about us? And, and we really need, we need uh, to work with the city of, of Salt Lake and our partners there to develop a gigabit broadband solution. So we, we are... Uh, I, I know that CenturyLink is doing a gigabit broadband trial in Omaha. We'd love to see the next stop in Salt Lake. Uh, one thing I'll point out, I think UEN does have a role here. Uh, UEN is the uh, Utah Education Network. Uh, UEN has a statewide presence uh, in, in every county connecting K-12, um, in, including very remote spots down in San Juan County, as I'll mention at the end. So, so that's a, uh, and they have a long history of attracting federal support for those difficult to network uh, last mile shots down in, in Kane and, and, and San Juan and, and Garfield County. So we think that can be part uh, of the solution as well. Let me, sh let me show some maps because I think it kind of drives home where we are right now. Um, I, I was actually at a meeting with uh, Mayor Becker of Salt Lake City and he, he was talking about Salt Lake City being the crossroads of the West. I said, and he was really referring, referring to tr transportation routes. I said, well, the same is true for, for fiber. And of course, if you know how right-of-ways uh, work, that's probably not that much of a surprise so that the, uh, the, the fiber routes fall transportation, be it either rail or, or highway routes. But the, the way we, we basically say it is, unless, unless the fibers ring along, along I-90 um, in Montana or, or I-10 in, in Arizona, the fibers coming through, coming through the, the Salt Lake Ogden metropolitan area. A lot of fiber on I-84 and I-80 and, and, and then going out sort of as you go to the west, either to Seattle, the Bay Area, or, or LA. And so we, if you wonder why NSA came to Salt Lake City, um, we've been able to deduce about five or six, but I think this fiber map is a critical reason why they're here. We're, we're in a very good place in, in the western fiber topology. Uh, so we, from a higher education perspective, we're able to leverage that. This is a map of the Internet 2 network. Uh, the Internet 2 is the consortium of, of over 200 research universities that works together on advanced networking projects. If you, this is the, the map of their latest network where they acquired fiber uh, from uh, a, a telecom level 3 communications. And you can see that Salt Lake City is very well positioned on this map. We're, we're what I would call a four-way node the three connections to the West Coast, and then one out to Denver. Um, and, and if you look around the map, the only other places that have similar connectivity are Chicago and Houston. So we're, we're, we're in, a, in a geographically favored position. This creates several opportunities for us. Uh, the California universities, uh, University of California system, as well as California State University is, are, are, are interested in data centers, data, backup data center sites outside of, of California, if they look at the map, both for Northern and Southern California, Salt Lake is the first stop. So we're discussing partnerships with there. You know, the, the saying, Tip O'Neill's saying that all politics is local, uh, it really re turns, turns out in, in networking as well that we, we have an excellent uh, partner in the Utah Education Network as, that, as I mentioned, really touches every county around the state. And so we're able to leverage that national connectivity and use UEN to reach the other research universities as well as the rest of higher ed and K-12. And that's a critical piece for us, particularly if you look down to southeastern Utah or southwest, southwestern Utah, places that are not on the beaten path uh, for, for, for national networks. Now, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, we talk about information and communications technology. Uh, at, at the U, we view networks as, as very critically tied to data centers now. 
Um, in fact, I think Enron had this right. Um, it, it, at least they, they vocalized it around 2000. Now, their business practices weren't quite so ethical, but they were right about this. But if you look at what a data center needs right now and why data centers tend to, tend to, to, to co-locate in, in certain places, its ability to get cheap, cheap and available electric power, we're in a good position there. We're about five cents per kilowatt hour. Um, we're not as cheap as, say, the, the area east of the Cascades um, in Washington, Oregon, where they, they, have, uh, they can draw on hydropower typically around three cents a kilowatt hour. But we're in pretty good position compared to, to other states. You need water. We've got enough here. You need the ability to, to conserve both. And one of the things that's neat about our environment is that in our data centers, we can use ambient air about 80% 80, 80 of the time. So if we just push cool, cool outside air over our equipment, that's enough. Uh, we don't need to run our chillers or even evaporative coolers. Um, so so though I think we have those favorable factors working here. The places where broadband ties in here are, are a capable IT workforce, which, which not only is, an, is enhanced by having good broadband, but also expects that when, when they make decisions to relocate, and also robust networking for the data centers themselves. And finally, they need good logistics, transportation, airport, and I think we're in good shape here. So, so it's not a surprise that we've seen uh, a migration of data centers to Utah. Uh, uh, Pete Ashtown from X Mission here is involved in this group that we've set up. But it, we, ha we have a group called the Utah Data Center Consortium. And right, it's, a, it's a mostly informal group. Um, it, it, and the neat thing here is NSA actually played a public role in starting this because they wanted to have a group of, of public sector partners, public and private sector partners. So they approached the University of Utah and GoEd, and, and, and NSA is playing a public role here. Um, Pete and I both have had discussions about some of the policy issues around NSA, but I think in this space, uh, they're being very good citizens in terms of trying to stimulate an industry here. Um, and, and then there are a number of other data centers around here. eBay, which has just opened up a new facility down in South Jordan. Um, Oracle C7, which is local, EMC, which acquired Mosey, which was a local startup uh, uh, for, for remote storage. We just heard from Overstock, Adobe, Xmission, and, and Via West. One of the things we're trying to do in the consortium is to focus on workforce development. Uh, and at the University of Utah, we now have a data center engineering curriculum where both undergraduate and, and master's students can major in either electrical or mechanical engineering or computer science, but then take enough courses in the other two disciplines so that when they graduate and are hired into a data center, they can actually look at the data center as a system rather than just understanding one of the three components, whether it's, it's the electrical distribution, the computational load, or the, the cooling, mechanical cooling. So we're working with these data centers. We're developing internship programs. Um, so, so we think this, this is a way of, of, of facilitating critical mass here um, in, in, in Salt Lake and Utah counties around these facilities. We're also seeing interest down in Washington County. Uh, there's the Tonaquint Data Center and some other, other facilities under development down there. For our part, we entered in this space for, for, for the university as well as our public sector partners by uh, building, actually deciding to go off campus for a new data center. Uh, we acquired the, the old Coca-Cola bottling plant uh, just south of downtown Salt Lake about uh, four years ago and have, have turned that into uh, what we believe is a state-of-the-art data center that supports uh, a, a very diverse set of, of, of requirements of the university going from the enterprise side over, over to high-performance computing on the research side. So compared to NSA, we've got about 2% of the electric power. We're only about 2.4 megawatts. We can take that up to six pretty easily. Um, but we, we really focused on, on en energy conversion. Uh, we're able to, to pull ambient air about 80% of the time and use that as cooling. We have very, you can see we have very large fan walls on, on the west side of the data center that we push, push air down our cold aisles. You know, we have a standard hot air uh, cold aisle design now. But when you build a data center, you've got to connect it. And, and one of the things that we felt we needed to do for, for research and education in conjunction with building this data center was to build a regional optical network. Many of our peer institutions around the country, and, I, and, and I can, we can think of, a, of uh, I think the first one that did, did this was, was a Pac-12 peer, USC, which has a computer science institute out in Marina del Rey, uh, south, south of LAX. They built, uh, they built an optical network using uh, 
um, LA Division of Water um, Power Fiber maybe 15, 20 years ago. We adopted the same principles here, but, but w w as, a, as a major research institution, we felt that the networking to our data center as well as the national networks was so critical, we had to essentially go down to the under underlying asset, which is dark fiber. So we had a number of motivations for doing this. Um, it's probably more interesting how we did it. We started out working with public sector partners. And I think it's a real testament to how well um, people play together in Utah. Um, unfortunately, we're competing against uh, Lynn Yoakum from the Department of Transportation, who's, uh, who's, been, uh, right, who's running another session right now. But she's been a tremendous supporter of this. We've gotten access to, part, to UDOT Fiber, as well as Conduit in the Utah Transit Authority light rail system. So we basically started that, um, a, 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 or started with that. We've been able to work with wholesale-oriented carriers, Boseo and Syringa. And then we, we, had, we were able to take advantage of the federal stimulus program uh, right after the, uh, the financial crash. So if you look at Salt Lake City, we now have, have a, an optical network that spans from campus up on the northeast side out that goes out to the airport. Uh, there's a, a, a principal uh, internet, internet to connection point uh, just, just south of I-80. Um, but we also, ha we also have a presence downtown. We get into the Salt Palace. Uh, we're beginning to work with, uh, with NOAA. Uh, the National Weather Service on connecting their sites. Uh, there, in terms of weather big data, there is uh, the Western Re Region headquarters for NOAA is in the Federal Building in Salt Lake. So that's that's a, that's our current target. So we got we have glass. We have a redundant ring uh, going around Salt Lake. We 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 light this with optical electronics, optronics, and then we then whenever we want to add either 10 or 100 gigabit per second wavelength, we just plug in the cards. It's not a, we don't need to go through a circuit provisioning exercise with a carrier. We're essentially the owner, the owner of the network now, just as, as you would if, if you had a, a, a say, a, a small campus for a business. We've extended this network to take care of our friends, uh, the Aggies and, and the Cougars, um, because we actually are very strong collaborators in the research space now. So we have fiber that goes up to Logan. Uh, we were able to get this through Syringa. We think this was very strategically important. Logan, it, uh, um, it's a beautiful place, but it's in the middle of telecom nowhere, um, to be very blunt. Um, but, but Syringa was building in, and they were willing to sell us a 20-year IRU on dark fiber. We worked with UDOT and Provo City to get fiber down to, down to BYU. So this, we, we have several large-scale research collaborations now, and, and this is a way that we can work work with the other two research institutions. So, so we may compete in foot, football once a year, but uh, 364 days we need to work together because we're all, the reality is we're very different institutions. So why do we do this at the U? So let me just talk about some of our applications. Uh, we, are, we are a national leader in network research and, and Glenn knows this well. Uh, we have a faculty member, Rob Ricci, who's taken over for the late Jayla Pro and we are, we are really helping set the framework for designing test beds for ne next generation networks. Um, there we have a system known as Emulab, which is a way for doing reproducible experiments across servers, uh, switches, and, and, and wireless networks. Um, and, and we hope to leverage that in, into a, even a larger scale test bed later next year. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit about big, big data. Um, big data is a hot topic. It came up in the last se session. Um, it's a big data on our campus. Most, most campuses are very good at provisioning uh, cycles for computation. Um, in many ways, we, we think of those as airplane seats. Once, once those planes take off, you know, they're sold. You don't need to worry about that. But, but once you start dealing with data, it's a lot more like real estate. You buy it and you may hold it forever. And that create, there's, a different, there's actually a different economic basis to providing this type of service at a university. Let me just mention a couple uh, things here about, about the drivers in science, and I have some slides. But, but it really covers the breadth of our research program, whether it's in astronomy and astrophysics, or, or genomics, uh, or, or uh, the, the sciences are essentially around, around environment and water, or, 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 or then just sort of basic, basic computational science and visualization. I'll give a, just a couple examples here. We're part of a very large astrophysics uh, project, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was one of the first telescopes actually to be digitized. 
It's on, um, it's on a, a, a mountain um, at a Apache Point in, in southern New Mexico, just, just east of Alamogordo. But if you look at what's starting to happen there, essentially, uh, rather, astronomy 25 years ago was an analog science. It's now completely digitized. They don't even focus the images anymore. They're, ju they're just taking the, the data out of the telescope and running it straight into a computer. So you're looking at, at, at very complex analysis right now on different distance scales through, through, throughout the, the universe, whether it's, it, it's the galaxy or going out to the, the large scale universe, essentially going back uh, to the beginning of time after the, after the Big Bang. Uh, you know, th this type of, uh, as you build these telescopes, as you, as you increase the resolution, you, you, you increase the data uh, correspondingly. We're now the data management site for this project um, under Professor Adam Bolton, and, and this is something that, that is, a, is a significant driver for our bandwidth. Another thing that's more local, and I think really plays to the, the advantage of the state, um, I learned this as a kid. My father was a field geologist and taught, taught field geology in Utah every summer. But, but in, in many disciplines, we, we are a great place to do field science. In astronomy and astrophysics, we've got uh, clear skies um, and also open spaces. Uh, we've built a telescope down in, in uh, out just west of Milford on Frisco Peak. Uh, we have a very large cosmic ray experiment um, just west of Delta on Route 6, if you've ever driven out towards Notch Peak or or Great Basin. These are very large scale experiments. They have significant networking requirements. And the beauty in, of these, both these experiments, is they're, they're in very remote locations, but we can, we can connect them through the Utah Education Network because they're high schools both in, in Milford and Delf Delta where, where UEN has, has presences. So the nice thing is, you know, and, 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 and so we, we've got a good collaboration and it really helps benefit science. And then the science can get, can get back into the curriculum in these schools. If, if you look at uh, more on, on the ecology side, there, um, Utah State and BYU, as well as the University of Utah field stations around the state, we're beginning to hook those up. Uh, the photos here are of the Usuria Mesa site, which is northeast of, of Moab on the Dolores River, uh, almost, uh, almost on the Colorado border. But this, it's critically important as, as we're starting to face climate change issues, especially on the on the Colorado Plateau, the you know issues around dust on snow, which will lead to, to faster melting of of uh, snow in the summer and, le and less water late in the season. The, the you know the, these kind of experiments are extremely important. Just want to mention one more, and that's genomics. Uh, the ability to sequence the human genome is really changing not only research, but uh, but also um, uh, now, now how how um, uh, medicine is delivered to patients. Uh, if you go in these genomic facilities, they actually look like factories now. Uh, these, these sequencers are getting cheap enough that, uh, that you, they build out very large facilities at, at hospitals. University of Washington has actually built out a facility that they acquired on the Seattle waterfront as their genomics factory. The thing that, and, and these devices are getting much more sophisticated because the amount of data that they're producing is growing faster than Moore's Law. So if you're an IT, uh, th this becomes a, a point of concern when you're exceeding Moore's law. And so it's driving new technologies, um, not, not only new, new algorithms, but also new approaches to storage. This is a place where I think the network is falling behind significantly. The network, I, I, I met with genomicists today, and, and they talked about getting computers pre-configured at the factory with basic genomic sets so they would not have to use the network. In other cases, people are, are FedExing uh, uh, tapes or, or other media uh, because the networks aren't there. And so this is an area um, in IT that's a concern and, and it reflects the fact that not only these sequencers can produce so much more information than say 10 years ago, but also the storage, storage is, is just so much cheaper than, than over, over that same time period. I want to close um, and mention one project because I think it, it touches on, uh, on the nature of the, of the challenge we face in Utah. Uh, Glenn and I were talking yesterday about Utah actually being one of the most urbanized states in the country, and we are, for the, the 120, 150 miles from, from Logan down to, to Nephi, uh, uh, going out maybe 20 miles to the west. We are very densely populated, and I think that picks up about 80 percent of our population. Our, our view of the state has not adjusted um, to, um, to this reality yet. 
But we also have a very, uh, what I would call a long tail uh, rural distribution. And at UEN uh, works with this every day as they try to, to, to establish connectivity down into, in, into in the rural counties, Kane, San Juan, uh, Garfield. Um, we, we're now involved in a project with the University of New Mexico trying to address specific needs in the Four Corners regions. And as, and we, as I've spent time down there, the interesting thing is even though the four states have, have uh, a, a common presence there, each of the economies and the demographics in those four states are very different. Different, different tribes, uh, different economies. New Mexico, northwest New Mexico actually has a very a hot oil and gas um, economy right now. Um, we're beginning to, to meet um, on a regular basis to, and, and also explore uh, uh, using uh, uh, um, uh, essentially energy corridor right of way and fiber in this region to prove networking, um, both in support of K-12 and the tribes. Um, there's, there's a lot of interest there. It's a, it's a great place to do archaeology if you've been down there to, to Hovenweep or, or, or Chaco Canyon. Uh, but, but this is the kind of thing that I think making sure that broadband hits these places that are, are pre pretty significantly off, off the end of the road but have significant uh, presences. The Navajo are the largest tribe and they are beginning to demonstrate um, significant uh, clout in D.C. Um, we work with Navajo Technical College. Uh, uh, Vice President Biden's wife, Jill Biden, was their commencement speaker last May. Um, so inter interesting dynamics down there, but uh, you know, even though even though we, we focus primarily on the Wasatch Front, um, we know that we have to hit the rest of the state and, and the region. I just want to acknowledge our partners um, because we we over the last ten years we built up a great set of partners around the state, and I think one of the nice things about Utah is that we know we're a small state. If we don't work together, um, we're, we're not going to accomplish anything on the national scale. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Glenn. Thank you very much, Steve. And Steve is one of the uh, gems of Utah. If you haven't uh, discovered the uh, diamonds, the uh, gold mines of Utah, one is sitting right here in front of you. I just, uh, since this is the big capacity data forum, I just thought I would talk to you for a few moments about why we see big data and what difference that's going to make. And I really see it in five areas, Steve. Uh, and, and I'll cover them uh, just briefly. So the first one is that video is going to end up being a significant driver, but not for the reason that you think. Because you can watch a nice high definition Netflix today for what, you know, a few megabits per second. But that's when the studio has a couple of weeks to go compress that signal. They actually send their computers through that video signal twice going and doing compression so that they can get an, a nice high quality signal out to you. And it's worth it for a movie because they do it once for a two hour movie and then every copy of that movie that goes out can be sent at a relatively low bit rate. So that's great. You can also do it if you're willing to spend a lot of money. If you would like to buy a Cisco telepresence unit, they have some wonderful, wonderful hardware compression chips and they can go and crunch the video down to something pretty manageable. Uh, in that case, a bit more, usually around four or five megabits per second, sometimes uh, eight or 10 megabits for some of the very crystal quality video that you can see. So you can definitely spend money to get video to look pretty good. What if you don't want to spend money and you still want to have great looking video and you don't have two weeks to compress it? And I think that's the new frontier. I think it's going to be uncompressed video. Uncompressed HD video is just a bit over a gigabit per second. And you would say, but why would I do that? And I think the answer is you can get two out of the three of low cost, high quality, and um, uh, low bandwidth. You can have any two of those three. So you either have to have high cost or high bandwidth or low quality. And I think that thanks to Moore's law, the one to pick is high bandwidth because that costs, at least in the local area, not very much. 
If you have a, a copper G dot fast, if you have fiber running to the home, operating that at a gigabit or even more than a gigabit costs the provider only incrementally more. It's, the difference is almost negligible. There's an optical terminal at the home, there's some equipment in the office. As long as that traffic doesn't have to go someplace far away, the cost for that could really be kept quite reasonable. So high bandwidth, um, high quality, low cost video, I think is going to be one of the drivers as long as we keep that video in the local area. Are there any applications for high quality, low cost video in the local area? Schools, museums, libraries. If, as long as you keep it in the area so that you don't have to pay to send it over longer distances where you may have to pay upstream providers, this can be pretty interesting new application and you can enable people. The, the software application, uh, one of them was done for US Ignite by uh, Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, goes and takes the results from an HD camera, we're using a Logitech C something or another that costs about 70 bucks, just sticks those bits right onto the gigabit um, connection on your laptop and sends it out. Even if you have an old XP machine, even if you have an old Intel Duo processor, it still works very well and you get nice high quality video. So nice story, right? But that isn't the real story. The real story is that the latency is much lower. The latency is lower because you're not spending time to compress it and then to decompress it. So as a result, you no longer start talking over each other on video conferences. I was testing out the system from the uh, EBC at the University of Utah to Case Western Reserve University, and I discovered myself actually finishing a sentence that they had started over a video conference. And while that's perfectly normal in an in-person setting, that is something that has just never happened to me over an ordinary video conference. And the reason was we had about a 30 millisecond delay total between Cleveland and the University of Utah, running partly over NLR and partly over Internet 2, it turns out, Steve. And I think that's going to change the way that people use video when it becomes that interactive, that responsive. When it's more like a piece of glass, my hypothesis is that that low cost, uncompressed, therefore low latency video will make a big difference in education, in healthcare, and other areas. So I look for that to be a big data driver. So that's probably number one. Uh, number two is sensors. Anyone carrying a sensor with them? Come on. No, no cell phones here in the crowd? You know how many sensors there are in a cell phone? Did you ever count them up? You know, you've got, what, you've got camera, temperature, you've got accelerometers, uh, you've got GPS. There's all kinds of sensors. I'm carrying around a, a portable tricorder, which tells me everything except for my health, and that's only because the sensors are pointed out instead of in. So lots of sensor data is coming out. Uh, even the NSA is having a hard time keeping track of it. In fact, I think they're even opening a new data center in some place called Utah to be able to help store all the information they're collecting from various sources. No, no laughs? All right, never mind. I thought it might be funny, Maybe but... three months ago. <laughs> All right. Uh, but the fact is that sensors are generating lots of data. There's lots to be learned from that data. And so moving that data is a second use for uh, high capacity users, uh, big data. Third one I would say is big science. So Dee didn't really talk about some of the folks in physics at the University of Utah and at BYU and other places where the physicists have been getting very intense streams of data from the Large Hadron Collider, which discovered the uh, Higgs boson, the so-called God particle. The data streams from that challenged what we could do in networking and caused network upgrades all across the globe, including here in Utah. So that's definitely a driver of big capacity is, is uh, big um, experiments like that. I think, by the way, the next big one is the square kilometer array. That's going to be generating huge amounts of data uh, on spectra that it's collecting instantaneously through thousands of antennas. So I think big science, and um, Steve is an expert on some of that big science stuff. So uh, the next one is the notion that people are not only going to be exchanging sensor data, 
but they're also going to be exchanging models of what's happening in the world. So 3D model, 3D model creation, 3D model simulation. We have a US Ignite project in Dublin, Ohio, where there's a company that specializes in airflow, Navier-Stokes equations, going over surfaces for car design. And one of their big customers is uh, Ford. And they provide this for a number of companies as a central service to go and deliver their results, to show their clients what these airflows look like. You have to have 4D models, 3Ds for the airflow and fourth for time to see what's, what's flowing over these things. And uh, a lot of the work that uh, Steve is doing at the Center for High Performance Computing at the University of Utah really is generating that kind of model data. And I think that that's really uh, a key to uh, some of the uh, big data uses that we really see uh, coming and are going to make a significant difference. And with that, I wanted to go and open it up and see if other folks had big data uh, applications they thought were interesting and could talk about it for just a moment or two. and get some advice on what to do about that. Right, so for the recordings purposes, uh, he has a mechanic that might be in one place, there might be a broken piece of equipment, an airplane or something in another place, being able to use very high definition, low latency to say, how about this, that, the other thing, be able to even torque it. The other guy could say stop and have it get there quick enough to stop torquing at the right moment. Right. And that had happened to me personally two flights ago. They asked for two volunteers to get off the airplane because they had to stick on two mechanics to go fix a plane on the other end and the, pl and the flight was otherwise full. So I think that's a great application. I think it's a great application. Anybody else? So one of the ones that Steve mentioned is uh, genomics. We all have a genome and we all uh, see the doctor every now and then even if it's just for a, a uh, yearly checkup. And to be able to understand what our genome says about us and how we process our environment and what effect that has on our propensity to uh, get various diseases and our ability to fight off various things and personalized medicine to be able to help us when we get sick. This is another significant area that I think will drive lots of usage. Your genome uh, uncompressed is about six gigabytes. And even if you can find the specific portions that are of interest for any given disease, you're still talking about a lot of information. If you would just count people going into and out of healthcare facilities in Utah and think about moving that genomic information to help make better diagnoses every day, that alone would probably double or triple the amount of bandwidth that we need in our networks in Utah just to be able to handle that information, send it back and forth and, and make, it, uh, make it make sense. In fact, the uh, owner of the, uh, I believe it's the LA Lakers, uh, actually bought the network that I used to be the CEO for, National Lambda Rail. And his plan for it is to use the nationwide 13,000 mile network that uh, I had been running to be able to have enough capacity to move genomic information around from one center to another so that he can have a for-profit hospital system based on genomic medicine. So that's a, a very impressive statement right there that's willing to buy a 13,000 mile dark fiber network capable of 8.8 uh, .8 terabits per second in order to have that kind of genomic information. So um, Steve, let me go and turn it back to you. You know, just hearing, talking about the, the video applications, I, you know, I was listening today to a news story about Amazon is, is now trying to follow Netflix in terms of trying to create very, very uh, uh, quick time to market uh, uh, pilots for, for, for shows. And I, I really get the sense that the entertainment industry, at least the traditional TV show uh, uh, economy is, is at the point of disintermediation as we've seen in so many other industries, whether it's bookstores 
or, or newspapers that, and this idea of, of, of reducing the cost of production, getting the compression, getting the tape out, out of the pipeline, and just getting raw you know, edited video out there, you know, I think that this is part of the story. And, and, and you know, we've got universities, we've got kids in, in, in film programs and, and, and entertainment arts programs, and I, th I think we might be at one of these disruptive, very democratic moments where we, we sort of overturn the Michael Eisners and the, the Steven Spielbergs of the world and, and, and see a little bit more creativity. But Yes, I definitely think that upstream creativity is going to be uh, one of the hallmarks of when people do get a gigabit and they can use it, we're going to see a lot more than six second Vine videos. Right, right. Yeah, I, I've actually seen it. It's interesting. A couple of universities have, have put out 8K uh, uh, cinemas. UC San Diego in their Computational Science Institute, the, um, the Qualcomm Institute, um, they, they have one there. Indiana University just turned one out because they're in the process of digitizing old films in their collection. I, th I think it's, it, it's, it, it's for us, it's, it's an area of a lot of interest, um, that starting to get that capability, getting the kind of bandwidth you know, once we get 10 gigabit campus networks, we can start doing that. Uh, we can start looking at how to deliver this over, over our campus systems. There's some startups in this space that uh, uh, are, are, are trying to essentially redo the, the cable network model for campuses. Uh, uh, one called Philo um, that actually came out of Harvard. Harvard for a long time would, would not, uh, did not have cable TV for their students, in part because they, they felt the students were there to change the world, not, not watch The Sopranos. Um, but also because of, of ver having very old buildings where the, the thought of running ca cable through those buildings was pretty daunting. So as they move more to internet-based uh, uh, cable delivery, I think we're gonna see a lot, of, a lot of innovation in this space. A lot of it's gonna be focused on tablets, uh, but, but I think you know, also thinking about very high-end delivery where you have a, a fixed screen and, and, and students can go to a place in a residence hall and, and and get an 8K experience? I really think that um, 8K is going to make a huge difference. At our uh, June application summit, the one I showed the video on this morning, we had an 8K video feed from Poland coming through live to the participants who were in Chicago. And the people who were there were just astounded at the difference between the HD and the 4K video that was, that was happening. And I think it's just like when you see your first iPad with Retina display versus the old display. The old display was perfectly good, right? Everyone was very happy with it. I don't think anyone ever said, no one ever said to me, oh, this display is not good enough on the original iPad or the next few iPads. But after you've seen the Retina display, wow, this is what I want to have all the time. And I think that's what's gonna happen on 4K. 4K is Retina display for TVs of uh, size up to 60, 70 inches. And 8K is retina display for somewhat bigger displays. You know, I, I had a comparable experience. I, I did my, my PhD thesis in a, in a gold mine in South Dakota in the Black Hills. And it was a pretty remote, dusty mine, the, the Homestake mine. And, but but it's, it's sort of found a second life as a potential national underground science facility. And so they've actually run fiber down there and, and, and are, are beginning to build it out. And I was at a meeting in D.C. and, and they had a, they had a demonstration from that mine, you know, and it was just it was just uh, you know uh, uh, full, full HD video. It wasn't it wasn't 4K at the at the time, but you know this was a place where where you know I, I never expected sort of these two streams of my life to cross. Being a, being in a mine with with no real access, we were lucky to get 64 KB to get uh, time signal down there. But now where you drop fiber in there and, and you're pulling out incredible HD video and what I remember in a mine you're really dependent on ventilation and you're, 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 you, they're, they're often these just yellow construction or that, that construction tape is hanging and you see that moving um, that tells you you've got, you've got airflow in the mine and, and on the HD video it was just like you were there. So I think you know, it, it's very addicting that once you get people hooked on, on one level whether it it's 4K or going to 8K, you can't go back. And I think that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's the, the hook of this technology and, and, and ultimately the driver of the bandwidth. 
there are a couple of real world applications where that extra bandwidth helps. One is that the uh, psychiatric community tells me they can't really do good diagnosis even over HD uh, TV today because you need to be able to watch the person's facial tics, little things that happen on the face that happen so quickly that it may happen in between frames and the camera doesn't pick it up. And that with 120 frame per second, 120p high definition, they actually can see that and can do remote diagnosis. So I think higher bandwidths than we now see on HD are going to be important for uh, psychiatric uh, purposes. The other one is for foreign language teaching. Uh, when you're pronouncing some foreign words, especially some of those words in uh, German, uh, the lips protrude in ways that go out for just a small fraction of a second. And if you're looking at that over Skype, you just don't see it. So if you're trying to show somebody exactly what it, it means to say Munich, it just goes by so fast that unless you've got the high frame rate, the high definition, uh, you just don't see it. I think we're just about out of time, Steve. Yeah, I, I, well, I just want to echo that. I think, I think that's a very important Utah-specific application. Um, we have a number of foreign language speakers here in a number of, of uh, atypical languages going beyond the usual Spanish and Portuguese here. And I think that's an asset for us and particularly, you know, we, we, we have a, a, a faculty member who runs a MOOC um, around Spanish language pronunciation. You know, getting, getting these subtleties, being able to, to train people to, to sound like native speakers, I think is, is a potential economic advantage for the state. Absolutely. So very last question here in the back, because we do have to run. Great. Say hi to Milo for us. Yeah, the 250 is the very raw data coming out of the machine. It can be pretty easily converted down to six. Less than that requires a lot more energy. Well, thank you very much. We've had a great time. Yeah, good questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. How about a round of applause for our panelists?